I'm more of a modern car guy, really. I don't get that excited about classic cars, but there are exceptions to the rule. And I think I might have one of those with me today. This is the original D2 platform Audi S8 that first came out in 1996. It was facelifted in 1999, and this is the 2002. So this is one of the last ones that was ever made. And in this video, I'm gonna tell you everything that's awesome, unique, and special about it. Really excited to tell you about this car. So buckle up and let's get into it. Now, before somebody gives me hate in the comments about the car not looking that clean, it was fully valeted before I shot the video. However, yeah, it gets dirty very quickly as you drive it, and I was gonna give it another blast before I actually start taking my shots, but it took me so long to actually get the car insured that I eventually ran out of time, so it is what it is, but this car was surprisingly difficult to get insurance for, and I couldn't get it through any of the usual apps I use for temporary insurance. I had to put it onto my own car's insurance policy. Wasn't cheap, but hey, I do it all for you. But there are a few things I wanna say about the exterior of this car, and as always, Looks are subjective. Let me know what you think in the comments about the looks of this car. I think it's a beautiful car. It still looks good on the roads and I haven't driven it enough yet to see if people are kind of really looking at it. But if you know your old executive saloons, you will know that this is a special car. Interestingly, it's only got 18 inch rims. You'd think maybe for a car like this, it might have bigger rims and certainly more modern S8s would probably as standard have bigger than 18s but I still think they look really good and I don't think they look disproportionate with the car. So that's all good. But something I really love about this car, so it's built on an aluminium frame, but it's also got aluminium door mirrors, and they are like, I mean, you could get your drumsticks out in those bad boys. They are solid, and yeah, you could decapitate somebody with one of those. That is really, really awesome, but yeah, they're hard as nails. And the other thing that's really cool is um, it's got a solar sunroof, and so it actually operates the fans. It doesn't power the car, but it does operate the fans in the summer when it's had direct sunlight. It will power up the fans enough to keep the car cool while you're not in the car. So obviously it's all leather inside and it's just gonna feel really hot when you get in on a summer's day. But because of that, it does cool the car down. So when you get in it, it doesn't feel like you're getting into a sauna. And the owner of the car said it's actually a really useful feature. It doesn't power the air conditioning in case anybody's wondering if that's the case, but it does actually use the fan. So that is cool and a really unique feature on this car. There's a couple of things at the back end that need to be mentioned. Uh, one of them is this GPS bit here. This is an interesting little design. Usually they're up on the roof. But yeah, that's obviously to show you that this has got sat-nav. Does it work? That's another conversation we'll have later. Um, but if you want to know that this car is obviously not just your bog standard A8, well, it's obviously this S8 badge here, which tells you it's something special. One thing that is also interesting and shows how old this car is, is this button and key bit for opening the boot. Press in with a real bit of purpose and then open this heavy boot. Your driver might be doing that for you though, so it's fine. Inside though, you've got a really decent big boot here. This goes really deep in there and 560 liters, you can't put the seats down, but that is a really decent square shape. You could definitely get a couple of dead bodies in there or a couple of suitcases or golf clubs as well. And yeah, a couple of tie down points, a little side bit here, but overall, not a lot going on. You do actually have some underfloor storage and a spare tire as well. So that is decent, that is a really good shape. The only thing I don't like is bare metal here. Like, I know like most cars do this, but for a car of this class and cost, I'm like, could they not just have put some of this there, you know, so you don't see that when you're putting things in all the way in. It's like, come on guys, it's really not gonna cost that much to do that. But hey, I'm nitpicking. It's a really good boot and the whole back end of this car is ace. So let's cut to the chase. What's so special about this car over the A8? Well, that. It's a 4.2 litre naturally aspirated V8 and post facelift it had five valves per cylinder instead of four and it'll do 0 to 60 in 6.3 seconds and it has 360 horsepower up by 20 from the pre facelift and 430 newton meters of torque and it sounds like this. That is absolutely glorious. Even when you put the ignition on, it goes and it just sounds orgasmic, absolutely beautiful, and I can't wait to get it out on the road. Now, it kind of goes without saying that if you're gonna own a car like this, you're gonna to have to take care of it, and you wanna make sure that if you bought one, you bought one that had a good service history, because, yeah, things could get quite expensive if they start breaking, namely the gearbox. It's a five-speed ZF automatic, and this one's never gone, but it is potentially something that could go, and if it does, you're talking about a five grand repair. Audi says they're sealed for life, but their idea of life is like 10 years, so that's a really important thing when you decide whether or not they're economical to repair. But this car's actually going up in value at the moment, so that definitely helps the case. 
But otherwise, I haven't found many things around this car that I'm going, oh yeah, that looks really old and like it's about to fall off. I thought there was a bit on the bonnet that wasn't closing properly, but I've now managed to get it to close. I found a few bits of paint bubbling around the car, but that's about it really. Overall, the owner has not had a lot of issues with this other than the brakes, and he's got Bilstein shocks and aftermarket subframe mounts on it. But otherwise, really, it's all about how well you take care of this. And if you're a bit tech savvy, or should I say mechanical savvy, and you know how to fix some stuff, it'll make a big difference. I'm not quite writing Audi a strongly worded letter about this, but it's not quite as spacious back here as I thought it might be, considering the length of the car. Um, knee room is pretty good, but seats from driving position, I'm 5'9". However, I've seen better in quite a lot of cars that are smaller than this and are not generally meant to be this kind of category of, you know, passenger carrying car. Toe room isn't great either, and you can't recline the seats. You can't really stretch out that much. Headroom isn't fantastic either. So people over six feet are going to be getting snug. There's a big transmission tunnel, and it's wide enough for three people, but the middle passenger's not going to have nearly as comfortable a ride as the outer two, which are very soft, squidgy seats, just like the front. You do have uh, an elbow rest, and it's soft, and yeah, it's quite hard to get down, but you do have also a first aid kit in there, which is interesting. You can take that out and use the space for something else. And then this utterly pointless cup holder bit with these little metal bits in the bottom which i wonder is maybe for like heating your drink or something but um yeah i'm not really sure how i can prove that um but they're very shallow and they just don't hold drinks at all so they're completely pointless for cup holders and maybe you could get them in the door balls nope because they're not very big either yeah, maybe i push you might get some felt lined but yeah they're really not very big you've got ashtrays with the doors and you've got a cigarette charger in the middle there. You could use that for charging devices. But yeah, obviously the age of the car, otherwise connectivity is nil. Um, air vents in the middle on the doors and it's it's comfy back here, but it's definitely not the biggest car. You do also have Isofix in there two seats, but they're an absolute nightmare to get to. So I would probably avoid putting things in there in case you really want to rip your leather. But yeah, it's, it's nice back here, but it doesn't feel like I'm sitting in as big a car as I actually am. So the first thing I need to talk about up front in this car is the seats, because I am struggling to think of any car I've ever sat in, including all the Volvos that I've raved about that have better seats than these. These are armchairs in a car. They are absolutely amazing. Leather is so soft and oh, really lovely quality. It's really aged well, this leather. It's probably been taken care of, but you've got full electric adjustment on both seats. This one's got four position memory. Not really sure you need four position, but whatever. So you've got four way lumbar support. You've got side support. You can lift these up electrically as well. Manual thigh extensions too. So you can get into a ridiculously comfortable position in this car. It is fantastic. So if you're doing long journeys and you just want to sit there, maybe just put on a podcast or listen to some music and just be really comfortable. Just try not to nod off, but the driving position overall is really good. The steering wheel doesn't feel amazing to hold in the hands, but it is electrically adjustable, which is fantastic. But yeah, it's just a bit thin for me. I prefer the BMW thickness, to be honest. And it's just, yeah, it's nice leather, but it's, it's obviously worn a bit now. And there's not really any buttons on the steering wheel, just ones for changing gear, which we'll talk about after. Um, but these armrests make a big difference to comfort and Audi's great for this. This one on the left of the passenger ratchets up and down. Doesn't go forward and back, but you can get a perfect position for resting your elbow. But this one, it's either all the way up or, or down and the handbrake gets in the way of it. So that's not ideal, but it's still really soft like you're in an armchair. The one on the door is really soft as well. So, oh, it's just absolutely glorious. But generally quality is excellent. You've got soft touches up here, here. Everything just feels really high quality. The build's great. Indicator stocks feel good still. And the door close. That is one of the best door closes I've ever felt. And that's it's a car that's done 125,708 miles. Uh, that is fantastic. And there is no creaks and rattles when this thing drives. Build quality in an Audi is always really good, but that, let me just do that again, because that's so good. Oh, that is such a good door close. So yeah, quality definitely feels very Audi-like and what I'd expect from a car like this. But the cubbies aren't the best, if I'm honest. Um, the glove box is amazing. You've got like a drawer, it's huge and it's felt lined, so that's good. But yeah, there's just lots of random areas that aren't particularly great, particularly for things like mobile phones that are modern. I'm sure back in the day with like a Nokia 3210, you'd have been fine, particularly because this car doesn't have it. But if you lift up this in other ones, I've seen this like phone holder shoots out, which is pretty ridiculous really, but I kind of wish I had it just so I could see the phone shoot out and bang off the infotainment system. But yeah, you do have space underneath both these and 
it's felt lined as well. So you do have, yeah, things not rattling about. So coins and stuff would be great. You've got this bit in the middle here, which is a cup holder. I think one of the teeth is broken on it, but I don't know what kind of cups they were using back in the 90s and early noughties. But yeah, don't really know what kind of cup you're getting in there. That is a really small cup holder. And I did think maybe this metal bit on the bottom was like a heat element. But nope, this whole thing comes out and there's nothing underneath it. So that is really not really useful in any way, shape or form. There's a little switch here and a menu button. No idea what they're for. And then you've got a bit at the front where you could yeah, put your fag ash for when you smoked a cigarette while driving. And yeah, you've got a cigarette lighter. So yeah, that's another sign that this car is very old. Door bins are not the biggest, but they're lovely suede and felt lines. So they're decent, but just not going to get a lot of stuff in there. Overall... The cubby side of things in this car are really not up to modern standards, but this cockpit's all right. It's just your bog standard analog dials with a little bit of digital information in the middle, which back in the day probably felt quite futuristic, but it's got the S badge to remind you you're driving something a bit more special than the A8. No problems there. But something I do really like is that this particular car has this dark wood walnut kind of trim around it. And that I think looks a lot better than the light wood one that I've seen in some of the cars. And so it doesn't feel quite as dated as those other ones. And yeah, so if you really want one to feel less like a 1980s hi-fi system that your dad had, then maybe look for one with this because it just doesn't look quite as bad, I don't think. But yeah, the whole center console is very dated looking, but I don't care about any of that. I love this gear selector as well. It's just really mechanical. And yeah, a lot of modern gear sticks are now these buttons or dials or shift by wire and there's no feel to them. So I love that about old gear selectors. I just wish the D button was the furthest back option, not the S for sport, because then, you know, when you're doing a quick three point turn, you just want to pull it back quickly. I wouldn't have to deliberately not pull it back all the way to get D as opposed to S because you're not always going to want to be driving in sport mode and using more fuel up, are you? But this infotainment system, I'm not going to talk too much about it because... Yeah, if you're buying a car this old because of the infotainment, you maybe need to have a wee word by yourself. You're not going to have a lot of connectivity. You're not going to have DAB radio. You're not going to have a touch screen, which is technically a good thing, I would say. Certainly no Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and not even SatNav, unfortunately, because this one does have SatNav, but according to the owner, it doesn't really work. So yeah, fine. What you really want then is a cradle with your smartphone and then hook up Google Maps. And if you can get your phone plugged into the car, that will then be just fine for you. One thing though, um, this could be a case for the facing away from the driver police because this whole infotainment is not driver centric. In fact, it's barely square. It's looking more like it's facing towards the passenger. And the cynical mind of me is saying that that's a, when they moved the steering wheel to the right side of the car, they cheaped down, didn't bother to redesign the center console. So that's disappointing. But thankfully the infotainment, as much as the housing of the screen seems to almost come off, uh, it does wiggle about and change directions so you can face it towards you. But you do have loads of buttons here. So it's it's great in that regard. And, you know, back in the day, you didn't have to worry about infotainment systems or touch screens that your AC controls are buried in. You've got physical buttons for that. You've got heated seats, which is obviously great. So, yeah, it's a good infotainment system, I think, for back in the day. But now, obviously, it's dated. But really, if you've got a good sound system, then none of this really matters. And this car has an upgraded Bose sound system. And I'd love to tell you what it sounds like, but the CD changer that's in the boot is disconnected because the owner uses an aux cable, which he plugs his phone into. Unfortunately, it's an older phone. Therefore, my modern phone, it doesn't work with. So I can't actually tell you what the sound quality is like other than through the radio, which is not dab. So it's just going to be quite distorted. It's not really a fair representation. But what he says is it's not very good for an upgraded sound system, which is a bit of a shame, really. But I wish I could tell you myself, but... Yeah, he basically says it's really nothing special. So that's interesting and a bit disappointing. But really, if you could just get some good tunes on the go and, you know, you've got your lovely comfy seat, the fact that all this is so dated is just not going to bother you that much, especially if you can do a lot of stuff through your smartphone. But yeah, I really do love this car. I mean, if you close your eyes, you could be sitting in an armchair just listening to some tunes and, you know, smoking a cigar. And then the only thing that would remind you that you're actually driving a massive, powerful ship would be moving your right foot. And then all of a sudden... <laughs> I mean, the gearbox takes a while to kick into gear, funnily enough. But my God, this thing needs its neck run to get the best out of it. But when you get up to six, 7,000 RPM, it's absolutely singing to you. Modern S8s are going to do 0-60 to in a lot less time than this thing, but I don't give a toss. This thing 
is still really, really fast in a straight line. And when you put your foot down, obviously it's an older gearbox and there is a bit of lag there, but there's no turbo lag with this being naturally aspirated. And once it finds the gear, it is just off. Naturally aspirated engines, there's just something about them that really is just extra special because the, you don't have the turbo lag. And so everything is just feels so linear and really responsive and uh, you know, this is probably the equivalent to something that's a, a six cylinder with a turbo, but I would way rather have a V8 without a turbo any day. I have to be careful driving this, I don't get a speeding ticket because it's just so addictive to want to feel that lovely revy V8 coming at you, you know, it's just absolutely glorious and it just pulls and pulls and pulls, it just feels so powerful, even if on paper there's a lot more powerful cars. I'm on a slight upslope, so let's take that into account, but I'm gonna launch this thing. I'm not gonna do anything fancy with brake boost or anything, because it's not my car, and it's too old a car for me to mess about. I'm just gonna put it into sport mode, put my foot down, and count in my head to see kind of how fast it is. Let's do it. Yep, that's 60. Woo! So that was about six and a half seconds, I reckon, so, Considering the age of this car, it's not far off the claimed 0 to 60, and that's really quite impressive for a car that's almost 25 years old. One of the great things about a car like this is that it's such a sleeper because it doesn't look to the untrained eye like anything more than a big barge. But that's great because, yeah, you can go really fast in this thing and not draw a lot of attention from the bobbies. But also, when you overtake other cars, that aren't gonna really realize what they've been overtaking. They're gonna feel extra embarrassed. I just feel a bit like in the movie Ronin, I'm ready to I'm ready to do something pretty dramatic in this car, you know? It's just like, guys, let's rob a bank, you know? Jump in, we're off, you know? <laughs> it's not the most refined experience in here and I'm totally fine with that. There's a couple of things there. One, well, I want to hear this amazing petrol engine revving out, and that's part of the fun of this car, so I, I don't want to lose that sound if it was too well deadened, you know? Um, but also, it's an older car, and there are a few grumbly noises that I can't quite put my finger on, and I'd expect that from any older car. So probably when it was new, it would have been very refined compared to its rivals. But yeah, none of those things bother me really at all. This five-speed ZF automatic, it's going about its business just fine. It's in sport mode just now, but even in comfort, no problems either. I've noticed a bit of jerkiness at lower speeds, but overall, no problems whatsoever. And so, yeah, as long as it doesn't break, I think it's a pretty good gearbox to have. And more modern Audis, you get a lot of dual clutches, and I'm no fan of those because they are less reliable. But yeah, any car this old is gonna have issues with reliability. So you're just gonna have to hope you get lucky. And about these gear shift buttons, yeah, don't bother using those. Um, they just feel kind of weird. You know, you've got left is up and right is down gear, and yeah, paddles feel definitely a bit better in that regard, but I wouldn't really bother with this car. I would just leave it in sport mode and just let the car figure it out for itself. But you've definitely got the option to go manual if you want to, um, but it just feels not very fuel sim. You know, the buttons are in a funny place as well, and it just, yeah, I, I really just don't think that's a, a great solution, and I'm surprised that that was ever really a thing, but just forget about those in my opinion and just stick with the automatic. The suspension in this thing is um, double wishbone in the front, multi-link rear suspension in the back, so it's giving it the best chance of handling well in the bends and it really does handle pretty well. The suspension's pretty firm but not overly firm. I wouldn't want to go more than 18 inch rims on this, although it would look even more banging. But yeah, it does stay really flat in the corners and it just seems to go around them really well and composed. You've obviously got permanent quattro all-wheel drive to help push pull a bit of both out of the corners as well. And so yeah, it, it, it feels much more nimble than you would expect for a car of this size. Where it possibly isn't as great is the steering and I don't want to slag it off too much because it's such an old car that it could just be that it's less responsive than it was once upon a time. But the steering is lacking feel a little bit and it doesn't feel particularly engaging in that regard. And I haven't driven a Jaguar XJF, but I'm guessing the steering and that's probably a little bit better, like most Jaguars, but it's not to a point where I'm going, oh my God, where are the wheels, you know? But it definitely is 
taking the sportiness away a little bit. Something else that is taking the sportiness away a little bit is the brakes. Um, the brakes are pretty spongy and I'm not the first person in a car review to say that about the brakes, but they do not inspire a huge amount of confidence. So definitely think, you know, you don't want to be leaving your brakes really late into bends. Just ease off a little bit and then put the power on when you come out of the corners because once you're in a straight line, that is where it is absolutely beautiful. But who would buy this car? Well, somebody who has a bit of class, but somebody who really knows their cars potentially and is prepared for some of the highs and lows of owning a car this old and that needs things probably done to it that are possibly quite expensive. But it's also a car that if it was your daily driver, yeah, it's gonna be quite expensive because the owner barely gets 20 miles per gallon out of this on a good day. Um, and I'm betting in winter it's even worse. So yeah, it's gonna get expensive pretty fast. And funnily enough, I've already put 20 odd quid in this and it, yeah, I feel like I probably need to top it up again to be honest before I hand it back. It really is eating fuel like nobody's business. Okay, I am. I am pushing on a bit, you know, but this thing is definitely guzzling fuel really fast. And so I can see it being more of a car that you would keep for special occasions and days where you really want to just enjoy the pleasure of driving. But as a daily driver, unless you're made of money, this thing is going to be very, very thirsty. And on that, I went into the petrol station and uh, the boy behind the till was like, that's the coolest car I've seen all day. I was like, ah, you know about this car? And he's like, yeah, I drive an old 7Cs. I'm like, oh yeah, this guy must know his stuff then. And sure enough, he was very excited about this car. And yeah, so people that know about this car, that really know, they are gonna be very excited to see it. And I have had a couple of people giving a wee look as they've gone past. And that might just be because they hear the engine and go, wow, what is that monster? But it definitely does get some attention. Visibility is really good as well. You don't have fancy cameras or high definition or anything. You've got rear parking sensors, which seem to be beeping at me more than they should. But other than that, you've got decent sized wing mirrors and view around the car is good. Blind spots and not really anything to worry about there. So it's not gonna be an easy thing to park being over five meters long, but it's definitely a car you can see around as well as you would hope for. I think if you're wanting to be driven in a car like this, then a Mercedes S-Class is maybe gonna do it a little bit better from the interior point of view. But as a driver's car, you know, this really was a pioneering car that brought forward sporty, large saloon executive cars by quite some way. And I really think you're gonna to struggle to find something that's going up in value that's better than this at the age it's at. And that's the thing, you know, it's just like a fine wine having one of these. You might actually buy it and potentially make some money back on it or at least pay for some of the repairs that you're probably gonna have to make along the way by the time you've then sold on and maybe got some of the value back on it. You know, there's not many cars out there that do appreciate and the fact that this one is at the moment makes it quite a rare find. So I suspect it will be in high demand and quite a difficult car to get a hold of, but just make sure if you are looking for one, you choose wisely. So guys, before it gets too dark, I'm gonna wrap this up, but thanks for watching and if you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to hear more about me babbling about cars. And if you've got any thoughts about this video, please let me know in the comments. And if you own this car, I'd love to hear from me as well. I'm sure there'll be somebody out there who will correct something I've said about this car. Happy to hear it, but this has been a real treat for me. And hey, I'd love to review other special cars. So if you're interested to have me review your car and you live in the northeast of Scotland, please do hit me up in the comments or drop me a message privately on Instagram. And I'd love to speak to you and see what car you've got because yeah, I'm always just looking to get new cars on the channel. And yeah, this has been a real treat, but thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.